Hi students, welcome back to the chapter 17 lecture. As I was saying in the last recording, there are two main body forms to the cnidarians. One of those is the medusa, which is demonstrated here by these jellyfish, and then the other form is what's known as a polyp. Um, these are sessile animals, so they're generally attached to rocks or other substrate, and um, the sea anemone here is an example of a polyp. Moving on to phylum mollusca, these are represented by soft-bodied animals, some of which are protected by a hard shell, such as snails. Um, this group also includes the slugs, oysters, clams, octopuses, squids, mussels, and scallops. And um, it's interesting to note that octopuses and squids are highly intelligent animals. Um, they have many similarities with other mollusks, but their intelligence sets them apart from the other mollusks as well. And the squid and octopi are known as cephalopods. They have developed a very similar eye to vertebrate eyes. So here you see either a squid or an octopus eye, I'm not sure which one. And then this bottom picture is actually my dog's eyes, and you can see that they are actually very similar in appearance here. This schematic shows um, an octopus eye in cross-section next to a human eye in cross-section, and you'll notice that there are very similar structures that perform the same function. So we have the cornea, which is the covering over the eye, the iris, which controls the amount of light that reaches the retina, and then the lens here. So the ma major difference you'll see is the shape, of course, and the fact that the octopus eye has multiple optic nerves rather than just a single optic nerve. But other than those differences, they're actually surprisingly similar. This is an example of convergent evolution. So this means that due to very similar selecting pressures, there have been two evolutionary lines that have led to these very similar solutions. So the morphology is very similar. They perform basically the same function. Um, the differences include the mechanism of focusing resolution and the absence of a blind spot in octopuses uh, due to how the optic nerves emerge from the retina. But again, note that this is not due to common ancestry. These eyes actually evolved independently from one another in both um, squid and octopi as well as mammals. Moving on to the flatworms. These are classified within the phylum platyhelminthes, and they are the most primitive bilaterally symmetrical animals. They contain three true tissue layers and an incomplete digestive tract. And it includes free-swimming planarians, which are commonly used in um, high school and college biology classes for regeneration studies, as well as parasitic tapeworms and blood flukes. Phylum Annelida is comprised of the segmented worms, so worms with true body segmentation Earthworms are a common example of an annelid. These are the most primitive organisms with a complete digestive tract. And it includes earthworms, polychaete worms, which are a marine species, as well as leeches. The roundworms are classified within the phylum nematoda, commonly referred to as nematodes, and they are the among the most numerous and widespread of all animals. Nematodes have complete digestive tracts, and there are many free-living as well as parasitic species. Phylum arthropoda literally means jointed foot. It contains organisms that are named for their jointed appendages, and it's a very large grouping. It includes crustaceans, such as crabs and lobsters, 
arachnids, which are the eight-legged arthropods such as ticks, spiders, and mites, as well as insects. And there have been over a million species identified. The body of an arthropod is completely covered by an exoskeleton, which is made up of layers of protein and a polysaccharide, so it's a carbohydrate, that's called chitin. Many undergo metamorphosis in their development. So a common example of an insect that undergoes metamorphosis here in Kentucky is the cicada. And they spend most of their lives underground as immature or larval cicadas. And when they emerge, they will leave these shed exoskeletons behind and emerge as the adult winged insect. So there are many different types of insects that undergo metamorphosis. Of course, moths and butterflies are another common example. And the type of metamorphosis where the body form changes completely, for example, going from a caterpillar to a butterfly is called complete metamorphosis. So as I said, there are many different categories within the arthropoda um, phylum. There's the arachnids. Um, several examples are shown here. This is a tick, a mite, um, this is a baboon spider from South Africa, and then also a, a scorpion. I'm not sure which species from South Africa. The crustaceans are the crabs, lobsters, crayfish, shrimps, and barnacles. Then we have the millipedes and centipedes. Um, if you are wondering how to tell the difference between a millipede and centipede, um, you just have to look at an individual body segment here. If there are two legs um, emerging from a single body segment, it's a millipede. And if there is a single leg emerging from a body segment, it's a centipede. So milli refers to thousands, centi refers to um, hundreds, so millipedes have more legs than centipedes. So you can't always tell immediately by looking, sometimes you have to count the legs, so there are some intermediate type body forms. This particular individual here is a millipede. And then of course we have the insects, which are most of which um, have a three, three part body plan. They have a head, a thorax, as well as an abdomen, and generally they're quite distinguishable. There'll generally be pretty obvious lines between the segments. And in terms of diversity, insects outnumber all other forms of life combined. So there have been an incredible number of insects identified, um, a few of which are photographed here. This. Um, wasp and the dragonfly are um, Kentucky species, and then these, this um, moth and this horned beetle here are from South Africa. Okay, moving on to phylum Echinodermata. This phylum name literally means hedgehog skin, and it's named for the spiny surfaces of many species. It includes sea stars, such as this stranded individual here on an Oregon beach, um, sand dollars seen here, sea urchins, and sea cucumbers. Okay, we're going to switch gears here a little bit and go into vertebrate evolution and diversity. All vertebrates have endoskeletons, meaning their skeletons are on the inside within soft tissue also, they all have a skull as well as a backbone. The phylum chordata includes the subphylum vertebrata and includes many common species, um, amphibians, reptiles, mammals. And there are four uh, main hallmarks of phylum chordata. The first is a dorsal, meaning that it's situated towards the back of the animal, hollow nerve cord. 
So it's illustrated in this picture by this yellow line here, and in this case it's continuous with the brain. Um, the second of the chordate hallmark char characteristics is a notochord, which is a flexible longitudinal rod that's situated between the digestive tract and the nerve cord. So in this illustration, it's this orangish line here. The third characteristic is pharyngeal gill slits, which are grooves within the pharynx. And the fourth chordate hallmark is a post-anal tail, which is just literally a tail that's posterior to the anus. And it's just this region here in the picture. There are three groups of chordates that are actually invertebrates. Two of these groups, which are lancelets and tunicates, have no cranium, and the third has a cranium. All other chordates are vertebrates, which have all the basic chordate hallmarks in addition to a backbone. Now it's important to keep in mind that um, you may not see all of the chordate hallmarks in adult animals that are within this phylum. So the chordate hallmarks are evident in all chordate embryos, but only evident in the adult organisms of some species. And an interesting example of this is the fact that our notochord only persists in the form of our intervertebral discs, which are the cartilage discs that cushion our vertebrae. So these blue discs here, which are not bone, but they are very firm tissue, is actually a remnant of our notochord. This is a simple phylogeny showing the ancestral chordate um, in relation to all of the modern chordates, vertebrates, tetrapods, and amniotes. Okay, fishes were the first vertebrates that evolved during the early Cambrian period, about 540 million years ago. The very first vertebrates were known as the Agnathans, and they did not have jaws. Today, this group is represented by lampreys and hagfish. So these are um, lampreys, and then this is a picture of a hagfish. The two major groups of living fishes are the classes Chondrichthys, which contain all of the cartilaginous fishes, such as sharks, skates, and rays, and then the Osteichthys, which are the bony fish. Cartilaginous fishes have a flexible skeleton that's made up of cartilage, and the vertebrate eye um, originally evolved in primitive fishes. So fishes actually have fairly advanced eyes. Cartilage in some fish hardened to form a skeleton that was reinforced by hard calcium salts, and this evolutionary adaptation gave rise to the bony fishes. Okay, moving on to amphibians. This is the class amphibia. They exhibit a mixture of aquatic and terrestrial adaptations, and most species are very closely tied to water. So here we have a couple pictures of tadpoles, which are the immature form um, of both frogs and salamanders. And then here we have an adult frog as well as an adult salamander. And this is an immature gray tree frog. Um, generally, they will start to emerge from the water in which they were born, um, still with a bit of a tail, and that tail is slowly absorbed by the body and helps to nourish the um, young frogs as they're making their way onto land. I'm going to go ahead and stop here and I'm going to pick up in the next lecture.